Hi, I'm Doug Atkinson here at Solutions Review, and we couldn't be happier to host the fourth annual Insight Jam. I want to thank everyone who's participating this week, as well as our Insight Jam sponsors, Datastax, Monte Carlo, Denoto, High Gear, and Seller Data. I also want to thank our Solutions Review editors and staff for pulling this event together. When we started this in 2019, we wanted to take a moment at the end of the year to celebrate enterprise technology with a social media event offering best practices and predictions. This will be our biggest jam ever, including 16 live streamed expert panel discussions over four days. And we intend to keep the insights flowing in 2023 with the launch of an expert subscription site for any tech professional who wants to publish posts on Solutions Review. Again, thank you all for being here and enjoy the Insight Jam. Solutions Review presents Insight Jam, a social media celebration of enterprise technology. Hello and welcome to day two of the Insight Jam. I'm Jonathan Paul, the Director of Multimedia here at Solutions Review, and I'll be serving as your host and MC for today's events as we focus on data protection and disaster recovery with four hours of back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back panels featuring experts and practitioners from around the world. So let's get started with today's first topic, challenges and opportunities in cloud data protection, enterprise backup, and disaster recovery. We have an esteemed group of panelists joining me from, I think we counted four different time zones. Let's bring them in now, uh, including our moderator, Chris Marshall. Um, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves and we'll start with our moderator, Chris. Uh, take it away and good luck. Thank you, Jonathan. So everybody knows that the only way to know if your backups actually worked is to do a restore. And if you're looking at your company's most critical data, your accounting, your CRM, your payroll, your ERP, you just don't know if your offsite backups have worked. Our customers enjoy the fact that we do a full offsite tested restore of their critical data every single day and then email them a summary of our findings so they know day to day to day that their restore is working. They don't have to wait for January when they do the big offsite restore test. Uh, Chris Marshall with Verified Backups, and I'm really excited for this uh, great panel of um, industry leaders who are going to give us some good information. How about you, Claude? Would you like to be next? Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm Claude Mandy. I'm the uh, Chief Evangelist for Data Security at Symmetry Systems. Um, we're a cybersecurity company with uh, the ambitious mission of securing the world's data. Um, our customers use DataGuard to gain a full understanding of how their data is protected. Our DSPM data security posture management platform lays the foundation for data protection outcomes and cloud security outcomes by focusing teams on their most important assets, their sensitive and mission critical data. So that's us in a, in a nutshell. That's great. Thank you, Claude. William, how about yourself? Hey, hi, everyone. Um, nice to be on the panel with everybody. Really excited to, to speak with everyone today. Um, so I'm William Bush, I'm the field CTO for EMEA here at Catalogic Software. We are a smart solutions and software provider for debt protection and debt management solutions. Myself, I've been working in the industry now for over 15 years. I've developed and delivered uh, cloud, big data, data protection, storage solutions for over 200 enterprises. So uh, yeah, looking forward to getting involved in the conversation today and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you. Doug, how about you? Yeah, my name is uh, Doug Newman. I'm the founder and CEO of RPO. Um, RPO is a solution for disaster recovery of workloads that run natively in the cloud. Um, we looked at the disaster recovery space a couple of years ago and said, you know, there are a lot of products and great tools to protect workloads that look like traditional data center workloads. But as you move those into the cloud, their architectures change, the risks you're mitigating change. And we believe a new breed of solution is appropriate. So that's what we're doing with RPO. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk about how people protect their cloud data. Awesome. Chris, talk about your stuff. Hi, Chris Plesha, and I'm with AWARE, the Chief Technology Evangelist. I've got over 33 years of corporate experience at a, large, a lot of large global brands, uh, heavily regulated industries, and I played a number of roles from CIO to COO, Chief Digital Officer. So I've lived in a lot of people's seats, walked in their shoes, and, and know the pains and experiences there. At AWARE, we're a collaboration intelligence platform. And it helps companies embrace control and, and leverage that risk and business intelligence across this new data set. So things like identify and reduce risk, 
strengthen security and compliance, and then uncover those real-time you know, business insights and that intelligence across your collaboration ecosystem. That sounds good. And last but certainly not least, Adrian. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, my name is Adrian Moyer. I'm a senior product manager and technology strategist at Quest Software. Um, I focus on, on data protection technologies that we have. And Quest as a company is kind of broad. Uh, um, we're kind of looking after data sets in, in several ways, whether you're looking at migrating, whether you're looking at managing, or whether you're looking at protecting. So I deal with the protecting side of things. And that covers pretty much anything you can think of in the, in terms of workloads, applications, whether they're on-prem site, uh, whether they're hybrid, et cetera. So lots of scope. I've been around in the industry for 30 plus years now. Thank you very much. Yes, we're all um, kind of veterans in a way, but of course, none of us are old. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is from the uh, bio pictures to the screen now, we have a number of uh, good COVID beards uh, being worked on. <laughs> And, and I don't know if that's a COVID thing or if that's just a work from home thing, but um, more power to you. I think it's more a lazy thing, to be honest, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we are all in data protection in some aspect to prevent the worst from happening. And I thought it would be helpful at the beginning if each of you could share, you know, a data loss, data disaster situation that you were somehow close to. Uh, let's keep it anonymous so we don't shame the the um you know the the guilty but let's talk about what it can be and then obviously we're going to look at how some of our solutions uh try to mitigate or prevent those things um adrian let's go back with you oh right sure um gosh um a, a brief anonymous story of a major data loss i would say it was close to a major data loss but having rain falling on your head while you're standing in the data center it's probably not a great thing um so yeah that that was that was an interesting one in fact the water was actually stopped underneath the false floor by the cabling that we had on the floor um thankfully that whoever did the cable management um didn't do it very well but hey it saved the data center so uh yeah i'm gonna go with that one raining on your head inside a data center um very close but not disastrous could, could be negative though um Doug, have you um, run into something like that? I'm not sure. Rain. I'll tell the story about lightning, though, if that's uh, appropriate. Sure. Um, so a couple jobs ago, I worked at a, a large, uh, well-known IT company. It was uh, releasing their first product as a SaaS solution. We were running on Azure. Um, Azure had an event uh, where an electric storm effectively took power out to one of the regions of Azure, but they had backup power. That wasn't the problem. But the lightning strike had surged power through all the cooling systems and fried the circuitry on, on both the primary and the redundant cooling systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so over the next few hours, temperatures start to rise in the data centers. And um, they ultimately decided they needed to just shut everything down so that they wouldn't end up with a catastrophic data loss. There was some data loss that had already happened. Uh, that resulted in about a 24-hour outage of that Azure region. Uh, for us, getting back up and running took about 72 hours total after that particular event. Uh, it's just kind of a good story about, you know, we thought that we'd be protected being in the cloud. We thought right. that we'd be protected because there was redundancy all over the place, but systems fail in, in interesting ways at times. Yeah, yeah, people don't always understand the cloud is just somebody else's computer somewhere. And all the stuff that can happen to your computer can happen to theirs. And uh, I'm sure Microsoft didn't put that event on their marketing material. Oh, but they were pretty open about it. They did a good job with the postmortem. That's good. Well, I have a couple more guys. Uh, Claude, have you had a sort of been close to a data loss situation? Um, unfortunately, as a former CISO, you know, I spent a lot of time doing data loss prevention type exercises and kind of following up things, you know, I'm probably going to go a little bit less extreme than accidental rain in the data center, but more just, you know, human error. People send things to their home addresses or type in the wrong email addresses. So I had to deal with a lot of those kind of very simple exercises mm -hmm. that, you know, people just make mistakes and they send a lot of data all over the place all the time. And, uh, you know, that gives me gray hairs. <laughs> that gives every CISO gray hairs because it's almost impossible to stop. Yeah, I mean, it would be so much easier if you didn't have all those employees. 
<laughs> I wouldn't. I wasn't going to go that far, but uh, that would be a simple solution. So I see Chris smiling. Do you have something to add to this? Yeah, in addition to rain coming through the roof um, and people kind of doing some dumb things, I'll go down that path. So uh, what we've seen is with the collaboration flexibility, there's all these channels and team rooms that people create. And we've watched developers loading um, entire customer lists and data sets in there for, for just testing, right? So they're harmlessly trying to help themselves build better code. But at the end of the day, they've got unencrypted customer data out there and kind of tying into to what Claude said, you know, somebody was trying to push one of these files to a, a colleague and send it to a, a Gmail account versus a work account. So it's just accidental, you know, people are people. And so without the right monitoring and controls in place, those things will happen and that, that you know, accidental insider risk is there. So it, it, luckily it got caught and the person figured it out and we were able to try to go retrieve it and everything, but you know, it happened. Sure. Okay, very good. Do you guys feel like it's harder to have a good consistent backup strategy now than it used to be? Because we have so much distributed work and we're partly on-prem and we're partly in the cloud and we're partly on somebody's laptop and we're partly on somebody's iPad and like, how do you, is it harder now to pull that stuff together and, and have a consistent backup? I, William, I see you nodding your head, so let's start with you. Yeah, I think it definitely is, isn't it? In terms of the workload distribution, it's changed massively in, in the 15 years. I know I've been active in the industry back when I first started. I think the 80-20 the rule was that 80% was deployed on-premise, 20% in cloud. And now we're looking at the uh, modern cloud native workload deployment is now 80% in cloud, 20% on premise, what we're generally seeing. So you have to have a solution that's got the capabilities in terms of being able to protect cloud native and on premise as well, all, as a, all within a solution. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely, I think, moved that way. And it's, uh, it's become more complex, definitely for a lot of uh, the infrastructure teams, the data protection teams. So uh, you have to have a product that's capable of protecting both on-premise data and cloud-native data, definitely. Yeah, I think sometimes everybody loves work from home except for the IT department. Yeah, 100%. Um, Adrian, did you want to add? Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting point that, that William makes. Um, that change that we've all had, that we all underwent, you know, the, the rush to work from home and the distribution piece. And, and from a security point of view as well, um, how many people have kind of enterprise grade networking stuff at home, right? I mean, no, nobody has that. Right? Well, maybe somebody does here. Um, I certainly do. Um, but it, it's that change, right? And, and that change has, you know, enabled a more, um, uh, an increased attack surface, I think, is probably what we want to see out, uh, out of this conversation. Yeah. And you kind of also have to follow where the data is and, and set those policies up for your teams so that they know where to store data and how to use it and how not to use it. So a little bit of education goes a long way. Right. Because again, it used to be simple. You save your file, you know it's on the server, you go home and you know everything's done, right? And it's not so much. Uh, did anybody else want to weigh in on this question of you know the complexity of backups um, with the yeah, current was, environment? I was going to jump in, Chris. I, I think Thank in you. addition to everyone working remotely and kind of that attack surface, it's you kind of mentioned it, you used to save it on the server. Now data just gets collected everywhere. Um, it moves around your environment. You know, people kind of copy it. The, the kind of example uh, the other Chris gave about moving it into your production and test environment to do something with it. That happens all the time. So I, I think it's not just the remoteness, but data itself is on the move and it's everywhere. And there's a huge bucket load of it that we haven't had to deal with in the past. Yeah, there certainly is a proliferation of you know, what we store and what we use for all of our research and production and manage, you know, manufacturing and so on. Um, based on the barriers that we've just discussed and how it's more complex doing backups now, are there any kind of general recommendations for best practices and backups with these distributed uh, work environments? 
Well, yeah. where, where, where do you start with that? <laughs> it's a big one, right? <laughs> I, I think I would probably start with saying if you don't know where your data is and what mm -hmm. data it is, like, how are you going to know what data you need to back up? I mean, the, the right. starting point is people don't have understanding and visibility of what their data is to start with. So if you don't start there, where do you go? <laughs> That's really good advice. You know, under, understanding from a business level as well. So what's critical to the business? Those are your most important things you look after and, and rank what you have in terms of data sets you know, from top down and then apply the right technologies based on the critical nature of the data sets. That's a great starting point. 100% priority setting. And then, I mean, if you're gonna look at one recommendation to take from today, it'd be three, two, one, all right? We, we yeah. all know that, yeah, that's obviously a strategy that was originally coined by American photographer, Peter Crow. That was just purely a strategy to protect his photos, making sure you've got at least three copies of every piece of data, two different media types, one of those ideally in an air gap location, be that on tape, be that on secured cloud object storage in this modern day and age, mm. and making sure that you're verifying those for recovery. So definitely some, uh, some key takeaways. That's really good, William. But again, it's interesting because it used to be three copies of a single data point or a single data store. And now there's 12 data stores from your, your sales force to all of these different <laughs> things people have. Yeah. And you've got to get, you've got to do three, two, one on all of that. That's correct. Chris, I want to toss in uh, a perspective on recovery as well, though, here. I think we talk a lot about best practices in, yeah. in backup. We don't use the word recovery enough in this process. But um, obviously, it's important to have your data backed up. But the rubber hits the road when you have to actually recover it. And if you haven't practiced that, if you haven't proven that you can do that in a timely manner, then uh, you can have tremendous both data loss as well as just service outage periods. So it's really important to make sure that people are thinking holistically about that problem. Well, I totally agree with you, Doug. You know, it's interesting. When I get in my car, my car checks the pressure in all the tires and my car checks the brakes. And like we wouldn't think of driving off with a car that doesn't do that. And yet we put all our assets somewhere, our data assets, and then um, you know, hope and pray are not really good strategies for IT. Yeah, I, you know, I, I throw in too, I think we have to think not only is there the, the technical solve for this, but we also have to think about are the policies, the inventories and, and our governance keeping pace with everything that's moving. So how have those shifted from we used to have it on a mainframe or on a server and now it's distributed all over and it's in the cloud and it's sitting on three different clouds and everything else. So as as companies have these multi-cloud strategies and everything, I think we need to make sure and, and spend the time to focus on your policies, your governance, and truly how you're managing all of this data. And, and you know, it's that inventory has to be current. Um, that's an excellent point. I'd like to, to add to that as well. Um, we've spent so many years now talking about backup and all, all kind of driven by the fact that we've got this large amount of data we move from A to B as fast as physics will allow us to do so. And we've optimized and we've changed. And we, we now have to kind of think the other way around. We have to think that restores the important piece, as has already been mentioned. And really, you should define your restoration, which will drive the policies for your backup. That's the important bit is, is when, as we said, the rubber meets the road, you know you've got to be able to retrieve that. But you should also think of it, you know, that's the important bit. That's the reason why we back up data is so we can recover it. If it's going to be hard and a struggle, then it's just going to be difficult for you to actually continue in that way. So think about how you want to recover, and that's going to drive how you want to back up. That makes really good sense. You know, when I talk to people who are not really technical about security and data recovery and all this stuff, I talk about really security is keeping the bad guys out of the front door. So if you think of your house, you want to lock the door at night. You want to keep the bad people out. But data recovery is what if they get in and they start shredding things? Can you mm -hmm. recover? And so really there's those two sides. Um, and sometimes I think we focus more on one side than the other. Maybe I'll just throw this out. Do you think people are putting too much uh, emphasis on the backup side and not worrying enough about keeping the front door locked or or are we doing pretty well in that? 
I, a, sorry, Doug, go on. No, go that's, I'm sorry. I, I, I was just going to say, I anecdotally definitely see that uh, security teams in general are much more focused on how do you keep the bad guys out than they are on what happens if they get in. Um, and it's a balance. You can't, you can't do just one or the other. You have to do both and probably mature both of those in lockstep. Mm -hmm. um, but it is critical to have both layers. Security comes in layers. And this is the final layer is your recovery capability. Totally makes sense. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it, it's, it's the, it's the safety net, right? It's the last thing that you, you've got to fall back on. If everything else has failed mm -hmm. and you've not been able to stop them at the front door, then you have to be able to ensure that what you can recover is recoverable um, to a certain extent. So you, we see kind of the mixture, you know, as Doug says, they do concentrate on the front door a lot, but they're beginning to realize that the backup is also then becoming a target now for bad actors to go and destroy that content that's one way the ransomware thing starts working. So yeah. people are picking up on that quite a lot. So the requirement for immutability and air gapping is growing exponentially at the moment. So I see I some people it, nodding. Claude, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think it has improved though from a security team's perspective. You know, they, they introduced the NIST cybersecurity framework that breaks it down into protect, detect, respond and recover. So they now have a framework that encourages them to invest in it. Is it perfect and does it go into enough detail about what those recovery controls should be and how to test them? It's, you know, a very light, these are the processes you need, but it's still yeah. better than it was five years ago, let alone 10 years ago in, in terms of encouraging security people to invest in those recovery technologies. Well, I think we're getting to the point that it's not a question of if they're going to get in the front door, it's just a question of when. Mm -hmm. And once they're in, what are they going to find? Is that fair? Yeah, and, and they're well motivated, right? I mean, there's potentially millions of dollars at stake for a large corporation that they can gain. So they'll be in there for a while before they do anything, if they get in. Yeah, definitely. You look at the average cost, and they're staggering, aren't they? Like 4.6 billion was the average yeah. cost of a data breach last year. And I think yeah. it's interesting as well you're saying about keeping the front door locked. It's changed from what it was five years ago whereas if someone gets in the front door they're going to look at wreaking havoc immediately they look at hiding in the cupboard for yeah. 287 days as the, the average time to identify a data breach they want to learn as much as possible that goes on within that enterprise before then striking um, so yeah there's some considerations there around recovery point objectives and version retention as well yeah. this is definitely well and thank you for the visual of some really bad actor from some foreign country <laughs> hiding in my kitchen cupboard that's really actually helpful <laughs> <laughs> no, I think part of all of our jobs is to like speak this stuff in clear English to people who may not have the technical background. Um, how do you things, and we, we touched on this a little bit because our workflow is very diverse and people are coming from everywhere. How have people's expectations changed? I mean, again, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, my expectation as an employee is, I'm going to get through security at work. I'm going to sit at my desk. I'm going to log in and then I can see my stuff. And now everybody wants everything everywhere. And I think, do you find that the, the employee demand for data access is driving us in IT? Or do you find that we're still able to drive that conversation? That's a good question. Um, I think there's a an element of expectation i mean as, as human beings we're all fairly impatient as a as a a, a, a creature right so you, yeah. you go to a website you click on it more than three times if it doesn't work you go somewhere else mm -hmm. and i think we've grown into that level of expectation in a business certainly now so my advice would be the the it teams need to have a really good sit down conversation with application and data owners to make sure they understand the levels of expectation that they're going to come across in terms of you know, recovery times and, or whether data is kept or how it's managed and looked after. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have that agreement within the business, then IT is always going to get the pushback um, from them. So it's uh, having that sit down conversation and, and say, this is what we can do. This is what we can afford. And this is what we can't do. Chris, it looked like you were wanting to jump in. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I think it's, it, it, um, 
it's kind of like that the outside world and the, and the professional world have blurred and continue to blur all the time and so with that people are you know your patience is short it's like if boy if it's not you know tick tock eight seconds short i'm on to the next thing but that's also caused us to get a little bit i'd almost say too comfortable in our corporate world so then you become sloppy or you know you're just making mistakes or you're you're you know you're typing so fast with your thumbs and hit and send that it's gone. And so I think there's some level of continued reinforcement and, and education that you have to bring forward to people because you know, I've, I bet I've gotten five link, bogus links on a text that came in that's, you know, your package is here or there. So the phishing is getting smarter. And if you're not diligent and, and you've started to relax because of that blur, it causes problems and it will cause more problems for us. Yeah, it's interesting. I think <clears throat> I wonder if every time in the news there's a big ransomware attack, if everybody thinks a little bit more highly of their uh, internal IT people, because, you know, if yeah. I, the, the problem with IT is, is like it's like with my doctor. Well, I didn't have a heart attack this year, so he must be doing his job. Right. So but do you think that the, what's in the news is really kind of helping us in IT? Because for a long time, everybody wanted to kind of make IT the the bad guy, you know, we're just the ones saying no. But now that kind of looks like a better idea. I, I think it's I think it's making it more relevant. Um, and and I, I could almost fit the stereotype. I worked in an IT team in a basement. So if you've ever watched the IT crowd, that that was <laughs> my scenario for a while. Um, I, yeah, I think it's becoming a bit more relevant. People are beginning to understand now that data is important and data breaches that they see with with uh, all sorts of information, you know, PPI kind of content that is becoming more important. Um, I think there are there are ways that could be done to to help with that. Um, but again, it, it's it's one of these things that's going to be perpetuated for a while. While there's still money involved in it, it's going to be it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. I like I like the fact that you said. It it's become more important, but it's not the most important thing. I, I still see when we do wow. some of our assessments that organizations are wanting to get their people working faster, quicker, et cetera. And to do that, they give them the broad amount of access to data, mm -hmm. to things that they need, because that's the most important thing to do business, mm -hmm. to get their people productive. Yes, they think data and security is important, but not as important as getting things done. And that's you that. see that in kind of how it, uh, flows into the access controls and the permissions that they give people. Yeah, that, that's something that I usually term as being, you know, uh, risk versus simplicity, right? You want to make it simple, you'll have more risk. It's as it's simple as that. We, we talk about it too. It's just balancing that, that risk and that user experience because we see it all the time that, you know, experience takes off because everybody can do what they want. And then as soon as compliance and InfoSec come in and start to put the controls on, mm -hmm. people stop using it and then they go find the next app. So to, to kind of, how do you find that right balance and, and really manage that? That's that's a key thing from, it, and it takes the partnership between InfoSec and compliance and legal and IT and whoever's kind of driving that UX for the, for your internal employees. But that's, that's a whole new front that we see is just being able to balance that risk and that experience. Yeah, it's the old risk convenience. So if I have 12 deadbolts on my front door, nobody's getting in the house but I won't make it out if there's a fire. So, you know, there, there's like that happy medium. And I think sometimes company ownership wants to push that really past the logical limit. Um, Doug, are you? Yeah, well, I mean, you asked initially the question about whether the, the news and the stories are helping. Um, and I do think that they temporarily heighten awareness, but I think honestly, this community is much more tuned into these stories than the general user is in the organization. I think we could be doing so much more just to share these anecdotes and help people understand not just that a bad thing happened, but what, what was that seed that initiated it? What was the link that they clicked on? How is it that the person should have understood these things? And that will just make the end users so much more empathetic with our efforts to protect things um, and not just be a blocker to their productivity. Definitely agree with that, Doug. I think people are either your strongest line of defense or your weakest yeah. links. Mm -hmm. Educate staff to reduce cybersecurity incidents is, is a real key thing that we, every organization needs to be doing, definitely. Yeah. And I've seen companies do phishing tests and they'll send nice Bank of America notices to all of their customers because, you know, 10% like of them have Bank of America and they just 
they're trying to bait you, but then that leads into an educational opportunity. Yeah, we actually do that at Quest. We do that internally. Um, so we never know when one might pop up, but they monitor then what's clicked and, and to actually see whether another round of education is required. So useful stuff to do. And you score pretty well on that test, Adrian? Uh, always, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. Um, and then there's the whole aspect. My mom got a phone call last week. There was fraud on her account and they were going to, she's 83. They were going to transfer her to the uh, Federal Trade Commission. And this was a telephone attack, which is, you know, wow. something that we haven't even discussed. But um, that whole social engineering thing uh, is a huge way in. That might have been one of those phishing tests on your mom. Yeah. Well, she passed. She hung okay, up on good. them. <laughs> she hung up on them. But uh, have you guys run into that at all? So, uh, yeah, I mean, my my mother-in-law was on with Microsoft once and was like, this doesn't sound right. So she called me and was like, yeah, here's all all the reasons why you're not talking to the real the real Microsoft. So, um, I mean, they, that happens all over the place. It wasn't like Bill Gates on the other line. No, it was not. Uh, That's so funny. Um, what do you have? I mean. We all, I think, have our default answers to this, but what are some advice you would give the people um, listening to us today for uh, enhancing our ransomware protection? Other than obviously they should sign up with everybody on this call as a vendor. And um, <laughs> but, but what are some things maybe the CEO, the CFO could be doing to um, cut the risk or at least to raise awareness in their company, which is sort of the same thing? I would say the, the the easiest one to go at is possibly the one that might have the biggest payout in terms of success is to educate, mm -hmm. to run courses that to show people what phishing attacks look like, um, what social engineering attacks sound like. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can use some technology to, you know, using things like safe links and, and things like that to make sure that any links are clicked on that, that are captured. But if you educate everybody so that they're aware, that, oh, should I click on this link? Or, oh, should I open this document that says I've got an invoice for X thousands of dollars that's been unpaid? I just got that. You just got that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just sent you that one, Chris. Thank you. you. You wouldn't mind paying it straight away. I've already paid it. Yeah. Um, so I think educating educating uh, the user base is, is like the quickest win there. OK. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? How can we cut ransomware? I, I think, uh, you know, the most quantifiable approach that you could probably have, um, particularly if you're looking at the CFO, or the chief risk officer, <laughs> is do an assessment of your dormant accounts, your dormant permissions. There's a lot of access that your individuals have within your environment that they're just not using. You can disable that and remove that, and that reduces the impact of a successful credential compromise, you know, someone getting access to a single person's account quite quickly just by removing things that they're not using. Uh, we have this concept of data blast radius, which is exactly that, measures how much, uh, what impact a single user and an aggregate, all the users could have in terms of the data points that they could touch if someone was compromised. So doing that and reducing that is a very simple and quick way just to very quantitatively reduce your risk. Yeah, and I've been in companies where somebody's left a year ago and they still have VPN access. I mean, I think we've probably all seen that. Chris, it looks you like, uh, yeah. And they're still getting a paycheck too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, talking about um, education and talking about the importance of reducing their footprint, you mean the front desk receptionist can't be a domain admin? Hmm. Well, if she pays the bills. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So besides the CIO, like we all hope, Chris, you were a CISO, we all hope that the CIO in the companies that we work with or sell to is really getting it. Uh, 
do you guys see evidence that the other parts of the C-suite, the CEO, the CFO, are more understanding the risks and issues, um, or perhaps still a bit oblivious? I definitely do. I mean, I I think it's coming from from the boards that the CEOs, the C-level people, are in those meetings. Everybody is very aware of the risks out here these days, and. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't necessarily understand how to solve it, how to do that comprehensively and whatnot, but uh, it's no longer, it's not hard for people to get funding for security initiatives these days. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I'd agree with that very much so. Um, we see a lot of people that are underwriting their business with cyber insurance and the insurers are now picking up on the technology that they should have, you know, immutability and backups or uh, air gap data sets or certain levels of security. And and that's going to come from the CFO because he's going to get the bill in terms of the premiums you're going to pay. And, you know, it, and it's no longer enough to say, yes, we do that. They're now asking for, okay, who are you using to do that with? How are you doing it? You know, has it been tested, etc. So the bar is being raised pretty high in that marketplace right now. So there's a demand for the technology to help solve those problems so the CFO can reduce his insurance payments. So that's pretty popular we see out there right now. William, it looks like you're kind of in agreement with that. Yeah, I'm 100%. And I think, um, you know, we mentioned back in the, the previously about ransomware attacks being regularly in the news. Obviously, reputational impact is almost as much of an issue as an actual ransomware attack put, taking place and can outweigh the impact on the cost of the business, the negativity associated with the attack if it's not dealt with in a timely and correct manner. So um, there's definitely that. There's the whole can of worms around GDPR and CDPA as well. And that obviously highlighted in the uh, the C-level offices the importance of data privacy and data protection as well. So, um, yeah, I think definitely it's coming top down now rather than bottom up in terms of um, data protection regulations and the importance of those. No, that's really good. And in my business, when I go to people and talk about a testimonial based on the service we've offered, you know, nobody wants to talk about a data loss and then put their name at the bottom. Nobody wants to put their company name at the bottom. Um, you know, and it's sort of like going out and catching COVID. It doesn't say anything about you as a person, but nobody, nobody wants to say that they've been uh, compromised or hacked or whatever. And I think, unfortunately, that undermines the awareness of the community in a lot of ways. People understand maybe something bad happened. They don't understand how it happened, how they would prevent it from happening from themselves. Um, and so I do think it's actually important for us to figure out how to tell these stories. Yeah. I couldn't agree more, Doug. That's, you know, doing those forensic analysis and the, the lessons learned and actually broadcasting them is, just doesn't happen enough as it should. Mm -hmm. so, Why do you think that is, Claude? I, you know, I, from a security perspective, it's always hard. You know, the, you're trying to investigate something and there might be a criminal investigation or forensic in, investigation, but there's also no incentive, you know, for an organization to be quite upfront and say, we've had this data breach. There's a lot of fines and penalties if they don't disclose it. So most of their time is, is looking at, do I need to disclose this and, and working through that? So they're under a lot of pressure, you know, can we see more radical transparency? I hope so. But people are still afraid that they might you know, kind of shoot themselves in the foot and open another lawsuit if they'd be a bit too transparent about how badly they stuffed up <laughs> during an incident. No, that makes sense. Chris, what are your thoughts on this? So, you know, to me, I, I would throw the challenge out to, uh, you know, CIOs and, and, and CISOs and InfoSec teams that we have an opportunity to educate the organization, right? We'd have this this knowledge and this data, the number of insider threat things we see or the, the external attacks and all these vectors and things coming at us. We need to get better at telling that story and become storytellers across the org so that the CIO, the, C, the, the CFO, or the CISO, CIO and CISO tell that, but the, the CFO, the CEO, the the marketing organizations, everybody is aware of, of not only the reputational risk, yeah. but but even the, the regulatory impacts. You know, we see all the time, you know, whether you take the, the Uber breach, which was, you know, credentialing on a, on a Slack channel, or you go into, you know, these $200 million fines that major banks are getting because people are, are using unmonitored and unregulated, unregulated tools. Yeah. If we're telling that story right, then 
you're going to get you know the support to do the education and do better investment in this and and build a stronger security program around it so i think it's it's on all of us to become good storytellers and not just sit back and be that function but to be you know we're we're now becoming business enablers in this in this new world in this this state of, of you know at least what we see in that collaboration world we're we've got a new business enabling tool that will not just cost but will drive and enable the organization well you're right for sure so we do have to think about regulations we have to think about liability and we have to think about will our job be there tomorrow i mean let's just get to the real basics a company that loses their stuff has a certain kind of high percentage of not functioning anymore and um you know, it, that's past legalities because as leaders in our businesses, we have responsibilities to our employees and how we deal with security front door and back door is how we keep those jobs. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Do I have anybody else who'd like to jump in on this before we maybe move to another question? So I want to talk about return on investment because the interesting thing about what we're doing is the best return on our investment is nothing bad happens and nobody knows that nothing bad tried to happen. Right? So I did a software project for somebody years ago and they saved $800,000 on a $12,000 investment. So that was a nice ROI. They still talk about that. That was an easy sell, but how, what are some of your thoughts on how, um, we can sell the ROI of better security and better recovery. I, I think in your last point, Chris, you made about having the business there and having your employees paid. If you have a solution that allows that to continue in terms of people's lives and the way they want to live and continue, I think it's a soft thing. It's not so much the dollars on the door in terms of ROI, but it's something that you you know it, it becomes a tangible measurable that you have a business that still functions because you're using those certain solutions yeah um i think ultimately uh worst case scenario is these could be existential events for businesses mm -hmm. so if you just look at your stock price look at what your investors value the company at or whatever there are hundreds of millions billions of dollars on the line mm -hmm. so why wouldn't you invest a six-figure fee just to make sure that, that that's never going to disappear. And so I think as people mm -hmm. really look at it is this, this is not just about uh, service continuity and can we recover in an hour versus 24 hours? This is about, will we still have, be able to pay our employees tomorrow? Will right. we still be able to provide the service? Um, and are we being negligent in the way we're operating the business? And I think it, it's pretty easy with that big risk on the line to understand why this is important. And it's really, it's an insurance policy, no different from our fire insurance policy, that if our warehouse burns down, we have the money to build another one to continue the business. Um, William, did you have some more thoughts on that? Yeah, I suppose that that you know, I, as you've mentioned, uh, it's sometimes it's perceived by people as the last line of defense and maybe the insurance policy that do I need to improve this insurance policy that I've already got? I think the evolution of what's going on around uh, ransomware attacks and unfortunately how they're evolving and unfortunately the investment that attackers are being able to make because you know, they're, they're succeeding on a, a relatively regular basis now as we see in the news and the reports that are occurring and, and they're managing to uh, get large amounts of money and continue to evolve themselves. So you need to ensure that data protection practices are evolving as well. Um, you're continuing within there to utilize the best of breed and make sure that your vendors are keeping up to speed as well and that they're producing things that are going to enable you to, if the worst happens, recover and continue the, uh, make sure the business continues to function. Those who are sat there going, uh, well, we, we've left it as it is, let's just carry on paying the maintenance on this solution are usually the ones that fall foul um, of uh, actually uh, the attacks causing major issues, outages and potentially fatally business is closing. So yeah, it's uh, it's not the easiest conversation at times around ROI. Um, typically, 
a feature that I still demonstrate in the field that I'm still amazed that wows people is instant recovery. So uh, that's definitely something, obviously, mm -hmm. it makes sure you've got a very low RTO. Uh, we can instantly bring back servers and virtual machines through that as well. But, yeah. uh, you've still got that wow factor around it, which, again, amazes me, given it's been around in the industry a long time. It seems a lot of people still aren't fully utilizing that as well. Well, I mean, I think each of us is much closer to like a magician when it comes to the cool things we can do for companies, um, you know, than the guy who's in charge of accounting or accounts receivable or something. So, you know, I work with a lot of different companies and I find that some of them, you know, are really value driven. And, you know, we love our employees. We're going to provide these great benefits. We're going to give them, you know, lots of maternity, paternity time. We're going to just be really progressive with that stuff. And I think the way you do your security and recovery is the same. So I guess an offshoot of the question about ROI is when we're speaking with companies, because we're all vendors in some way, about the need to improve their uh, improve their game, do we lead that conversation with like company values or do we lead that conversation with fear? Wow. Um well, fear is like the hand grenade. It, it, it will, it will. You, you let that go, and it will affect everybody around the table, right? Um, you included, in terms of throwing the hand grenade. So, we always tend to look at things of, of, of understanding where their gaps are, understanding what their issues are. What are they? What problems are they trying to solve? Where are you? Where are you lacking? And, and I would say that in you'll sometimes find that you won't get everything from a single vendor yeah. you won't get everything that you need to to meet your requirements and that's the important thing is, is don't compromise on a single solution because that's again that's the easy thing right. you need to find the the technologies that you require that meet your requirements and, and not be driven too much by a vendor um right. but also understanding you know how that's going to map into your overall plan so what do you think, Claude, uh, when you're speaking with people and they need to really improve what they're doing, do you lead with their sort of values or do you lead with fear or some of both? I'm always going to try to avoid the fear, uncertainty and doubt approach. I think there's enough of that in our, our industry more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just have to open a newspaper or, or scroll through Twitter or LinkedIn and you'll have an incident and they're going to ask you about it as well. I think as an industry particularly in the security space, I'm always encouraging people to, yes, you can take advantage of these incidents to say how your solution can help, but focus on the help. This is how we deal with this incident. This is how we deal with this incident. It's about the opportunities to improve security. It's a slight tweak, but it's not going, this could happen to you. This is, this right. happened to this organization. This is how you need organizations can address this problem. You're not kind of pushing it down their throat saying you're going to be personally liable for a security incident if you don't buy my product, which is. <laughs> of course, but we all have good stuff. Doug, you mentioned earlier, you know, the importance of recovery and making sure that your workloads are recoverable. Yeah. What are some trends you all are seeing as far as testing of backups? Because it used to be literally. You order a bunch of pizza, you go off to a hotel, you get a bunch of computers and you reconstruct the company and and you do that once a year and then you feel like you're OK. And is that kind of how it still is or is it changing? So I know, um, you know, my business is about recovery of cloud workloads. Um, and really what's interesting about what we've done is said it's about more than just the data. You need to recover the entire environment. Yeah. And so how do you bring back the configuration, the infrastructure? and restore the data into that through an automated process. Um, we are finding that, that people who previously would test annually their DR process, mm -hmm. and generally I've always found that was a long weekend where they made a laundry list of things they need to fix before the next test. Um, they're actually able to do that much more aggressively now um, because there is so much automation available, especially mm -hmm. for cloud workloads, uh, to make it easy to stand up your recovery environment, restore the data, and you know, run that test in an hour instead of a weekend. Does anybody else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I can jump in. If, I think Adrian was going to jump in as well. But uh, what we've seen from our perspective is the ability to actually continually monitor the actual operations of these backup accounts. All of them is are using accounts to, to kind of read data, 
and to write it on each side, unless you're actually monitoring that it's reading that data and writing it and doing that continuously, you're going to find some surprises when you start to do the recovery side. You still need to do those tests and work through that. I mean, there's, there's always that, but we do have that current capability. If you're looking at the operations at the data layer of what people are actually doing on that, on that backup to give them some comfort. Uh, Chris, Adrian, or William, you... would you like to jump in on that and the importance of testing and how that's changing? Yeah, sure. So I, I think um, I'll say I enjoyed uh, in the early days some learning experiences and enjoying some of those pizzas on premise and doing the recovery testing at the annual tests. But um, yeah, they were character building. Obviously, it's not like that anymore. Um, you know, the importance of data has grown since then. Um, enhancements in data protection solutions, you've got scheduled recoveries, instant recovery, and the ability to tap into cloud based resources for disaster recovery. So mm -hmm. We're doing that from our offices. We're doing that while workloads are online. We're doing dynamic recovery testing and making it a lot more automated than it was in the past and a lot simpler to do. So the man hours have definitely reduced. I think multi-cloud infrastructure has brought both mm -hmm. benefits and potentially complexities here as well. So mm -hmm. some backup vendors can't facilitate movement between clouds with multi-cloud DR. So again, when you're looking at the market, looking at ones that potentially can do multi-cloud disaster recovery is very key as well. So um, yeah, there's, a, there's some advantage definitely in the modern day and age. So, so really just about the last question before Jonathan pops back in, um, I would love to get some input or guidance from you, uh, each of you as to what should companies look for when they're looking for a new IT or solution vendor? And uh, Adrian? Uh, yeah, I'll start with that. Um, an old adage, I guess, uh, don't have all your eggs in one basket. Um, and I said this earlier, if, if you're looking for technology solutions to solve problems, you may not find that one vendor does everything for you. You may find that you're going to need several of them, um, in which case, if you are, look at integration points, look at, you know, can I, can I make it better with vendor A and vendor B? If I put them together, will there be, you know, will it get worse? I mean, that's the other thing, right? It's, it's a management overhead. To think about too but um don't compromise is all i would say don't compromise your data just because you think you have to deal with a single vendor to get what you need um that's been the case in our industry for an awful long time um and there really is no need anymore you you can pick and choose what you want to deliver what you need for your infrastructure and data sets that's good advice but we have a few more waiting um chris what would you say I think uh, take the time to understand the full scope of the problem, right? What, 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 and where, and how much are you trying to solve? And then I, I take a little different tack where you can consolidate and simplify the number of uh, vendors it takes to do something. Mm -hmm. You might give up a little bit of functionality that to uh, have more simplification across that realm. But if you have the full scope, now you can solve for each of those you know, vertical cylinders that you need to, to cover and i think you, you got to take the time to plan up front and understand that and then you can start to seek out the, the solutions for it that makes sense william yeah i think i'll take that approach as well do, do your uh, due diligence ensure that you've stated your requirements clearly um find who the standout vendors are who are willing to work with yourselves build a data protection data security solution to meet your needs um Whittle it down, run proof of concepts, you know, t test every vendor pretty much out there is willing to test now. Mm -hmm. um, and if you've not got particularly deep pockets, don't get stuck with a vendor off the proprietary hardware as the upgrade costs are going to bite you. So, um, yeah, so that's my advice. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um, I think I heard from everybody. Well, Doug. I'll chime in. Yeah, really quickly. Um, I mean, in my world where we're dealing with uh, primarily public cloud infrastructure, there are a lot of first party solutions built into these public clouds. Um, but there are some fantastic third party solutions that bring these pieces together and make it uh, much simpler for you to have a comprehensive data protection and disaster recovery capability. So I just encourage people to, to look beyond the first party solutions as well. You don't have to DIY your own uh, data protection strategy here. There are a lot of great products that will save you a lot of time and money uh, by giving you a solution on top of building blocks in the cloud. 
No, that makes sense. So those services really give you the foundation, but there's so many other things that you can do beyond what they offer. Yeah, it's left to you to really cobble it all together. Um, mm -hmm. And most people do cobble it and cobbling isn't necessarily great software architecture. So it's not good unless you're making shoes. Uh, Claude, did you have anything you wanted to add to this? Awesome. Great advice already. I, I think whenever you're looking at a vendor, make sure that they, they're not introducing more risk you know, because of the deployment model or, or what what they're doing with uh, et cetera. You know, we, we've got a lot of supply chain issues already within security and the rest of the organization. Make sure whoever you're choosing from your security perspective or your backup security isn't introducing a, another supply chain risk to your organization. That's excellent. You want to have a vendor that makes things better, not worse. Excellent discussion, gentlemen. I wanted to pop back in towards the end here and uh, invite each of you to take 30 seconds or so to uh, share some one final piece of salient advice or promote your solution, share a link to your blog, uh, whatever you'd like. The floor is yours. Uh, Chris Marshall, we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Guys, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Um, I founded Verified Backups to solve the problems of doing restore tests because without restore tests, you don't have anything. Um, I got a patent for the process. It's extremely unique and um, very happy with how things are going. Uh, www.verifiedbackups.com. And again, thank you all for being on this panel today. Thank you for moderating. You have done an excellent job. Uh, Claude, let's go to you next. Thanks. And thanks, Chris. And thanks, everyone, for this. This was a, a fascinating discussion and really worthwhile that. Um, from my perspective, if you want to find out more about Symmetry Systems and our data security posture management solution, you can find us at symmetrysystems.com or on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm personally active on both of those platforms. So let's connect personally as well. Thanks again for everyone on the call. Thank you. Uh, William. Thanks, Chris, again, for, for moderating today. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you all. So um, yeah, if you want to learn more about the data protection, data management solutions that Catalogic Software can offer, uh, please go to www.catalogicsoftware.com. Um, I'm active across social media as well on LinkedIn, on Virtual Vision on Twitter. So please do connect with me on there, and I'll happily have a conversation with you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Doug, you're up. Yeah. Um, so thanks again for including me today, guys. It's been fantastic to meet all of you. Um, for those of you watching that are running workloads in the public cloud, specifically in AWS, and trying to understand how do I solve this hairy problem of disaster recovery, um, that's what my life is all about these days, which my team focuses on. Um, and we make it really easy for you to have a comprehensive DR strategy for your entire AWS environment. Just encourage people to check us out at rpo.io, and uh, we'd love to show it to you in person sometime. Awesome. Chris Plesha. Hey, well, as with everybody else, thank you all. It was a, it was a great discussion and, and opportunity. So with Aware, we are a collaboration intelligence platform that brings enterprise value and strengthens security. And when you think in that <clears throat> collaboration space, it's all about that risk intelligence and, and security compliance and legal, but also that business intelligence. How are you getting the most out of your people, the feedback process improvement from the break room to the boardroom? So, being able to see all that and understand it and unlock it is what we do. And you can find us at awarehq.com or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. I'd love to have a discussion with you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Adrian. Hi. Yes. Well, um, thank you very much, everybody, for being on this call today. It's been a great discussion. Um, if you want to find out more about our solutions, go to quest.com forward slash data hyphen protection. Um, we're all about ensuring that, that the data that you do have protected is optimized and secure all the way from source to cloud, depending on where you, where you want to keep it. Uh, we are completely software defined as well. So even storage solutions, you can run it anywhere, pretty much on anything um, to deliver exactly what you need, whether your workloads are on premise or in cloud or both. Excellent. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all for your time and expertise this afternoon. It's been a, a pleasure to listen to. Uh, and please stick around. Um, in just a minute as we continue our back-to-back -back coverage of disaster recovery today as we do our next panel on the state of data privacy tools and practices. My name is Jonathan Paula for Solutions Review. Thanks again for watching and listening and thank you again to our panelists for their participation. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thanks.